right, good morning. I'll go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Uh, starting at verse 15. Well, actually, we, you can start at the beginning of the chapter if you want to give the whole context, and I'll explain that. 15, starting at verse 15, chapter 9, 1 Corinthians. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me, for it were better for me to die than any man should make my glory void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, and I, uh, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without law to God, but unto to the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law, to, to the weak I became weak, and that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker thereof with you. Okay, know ye not, they which run in a race run all, but one to receive the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, um, this is where we're going to be focusing on it. And every every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. You know, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, uh, so find I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest my, that any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Okay, now in context, this is Paul writing to the church of Corinth, speaking in particular uh, of his apostleship. If we were to go back to the beginning of the chapter, he's writing to them and defending himself as an apostle. In other words, that they're fully aware of the fact that he was God's apostle to the Gentiles. They're fully aware as well. Oh, I guess it started to rain. <laughs> okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you guys, if you guys are coming in, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So he's, he's defending his apostleship here to, uh, to the believers there at Corinth. Now, they're fully aware of the fact that he was an apostle. Okay? They are a product of power of God in his life. Uh, they are a direct result of God not only having called him and directed him specifically to Corinth, but also uh, having used him while there and to be able to share the gospel with him. And then you know, they've come to know Christ as a result directly firsthand of his uh, ministry to them. So they, 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 they've been witness firsthand, uh, and they're a product firsthand of God's power in his life. So them coming to question as to whether or not he's, a, he's actually a God-called apostle is kind of foolish, but he's, he's sitting here defending himself, and then he puts forth that um, part of the question was, if we, we didn't read this part, was uh, we kind of jumped in the middle of it, was that uh, he was being accused of being a thief uh, or rather somebody that is fleecing the flock, so to speak. And that is, is that he's ministering to them to get money from them, to get something out of them, uh, 1 Corinthians 9. And so um, he's, his defense is that, you know, I do this willingly. In other words, I have a responsibility, I have an obligation laid upon me by God. And so this is not something that I'm doing for money or for gain. Um, and then his argument towards the end is that everybody, um, he's, he's done this and he's made himself all things to all men so that he might be able to reach as many as he, as he possibly can. 
And then um, here's where we're going to be focusing on for today is that um, starting at verse 24, you know, know you that, um, or verse 25, I'm sorry, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Okay, so the idea of temperance. And then verse 27, that he keeps under his body uh, to bring it into subjection, lest by any means when he has preached to others, uh, I myself should be a castaway, that he should be a castaway. In other words, he, he, the, the, the word there is reprobate or disqualify. In other words, so if I am preaching one thing but living something different, then I'm, I'm, I'm worthless, I'm basically useless, uh, and I'm nothing. Okay, and so this is kind of an introduction. We're going to be starting a series on the topic of addictions. Okay, addictions. Now, according to the dictionary, there's multiple uh, definitions for an addiction. Okay, basic, most common one was okay, the fact or condition of being addicted to a particular substance, thing, or activity. And then the synonym would be dependency or a uh, habit problem. Uh, and the dependency, obviously, is a state of being dependent on something uh, where as you would need something, be it a substance or an activity, in order to be able to function properly. It's always used in a negative connotation. I actually did a search on are there anything uh, as positive addictions. Is it ministry? Well, the, yeah, that is mentioned. That is something that we are going to cover, though. He, Because uh, Paul writes of it, that uh, there was a certain group that addicted themselves to the ministry. Uh, the funny thing is that the word, as far as the, the, the Greek word used for it is, it says, um, it's in middle passive, but it's a, uh, it's, it's translated other, other, th other d different other words as far as when it used in other contexts, but in, um, when Paul writes of it, it, um, it, it's as if you you commit yourself. Uh, so it's, it's a decided uh, thing. But uh, an addiction, contrary to popular belief, though there is a physiological aspect to it, and it's, it's primarily psychological, you have, uh, it's ultimately, it run, it's, it's a choice constituted by the person that is, you know, I guess find themselves in bondage to either uh, be it a substance or a relationship or whatever it is. Uh, foundationally, all addictions are um, choices of the will. Okay, now, they might have lost control because there's a physiological dependency and then they give themselves over to that. Uh, but ultimately, it's always a choice of the will. Nobody, uh, well, I was going to say nobody's born addicted, but that's not necessarily true because you do have instances of uh, like crack babies and where the parent, the mother was using uh, drugs and alcohol while, while the baby was in the womb and then when the baby's born, um, they, they, have that, they have a dependency towards that substance. So they're born either uh, deformed or they're born uh, with all kind of other health issues beyond the fact that they have a dependency to this foreign substance uh, that they shouldn't have. Uh, but by and large, uh, even then that was, again, a, though that wouldn't have been their fault, that wouldn't have been a choice of their, on their part, uh, that was a choice on a mother's part. Uh, nevertheless, the thing is a, a, an addiction is going to be something that is a choice of the will. You, uh, quite frankly, you choose to be in a position or put yourself in a position where you have a dependency, be it on a, sub, on a substance or a relationship or uh, whatever it is that you're dependent upon. Now, uh, why is it that people uh, become addicts or are addicted? What's, what's the underlying root cause? I mean, you have multiple, but by and large, the main one, uh, if, you were to, if you were to go through most of the literature uh, put forth by <coughs> National Health Institutes, uh, by <laughs> yeah, Psychology Today, or any, any of these other secular sources, fact is is that most people are trying to find an escape to either problems in their life or a situation that they find themselves in uh, which in most cases has always been because they, they uh, poor choices that were made not in all cases but in, in the majority of cases because of yes 
finish your sentence you recall? Uh, because of, yeah, just because of poor choices that were made. Yes. I, I guess I have a question. It's, do you have statistics as far as, it seems to me that most people who become addicted to substances, if that's what you know, we're specifically talking about, you know, it happens usually at, normally at an early age, like, um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of teenagers by, by, there the, age are, of, but by the age of 15. What, what are the stats as far as age groups? And I, I would say that, just guessing, that oftentimes that's peer-oriented addiction. In other words, it's not so much escapism. You know, I mean, there are a lot of kids that have horrific life circumstances. But I think, to me, I just remember what it was like as a teenager, more of a, come on, man, try this, is more of the doorway or the gateway than necessarily a, you know, I've got a problem. You know, it's a, like, you know, a home problem or home issues. Could be. Maybe it's, maybe it's sort of a, like a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. That I don't have as far as, there are, and they're, spe they're substance specific. In other words, you have for alcohol related or marijuana related or opioid related. Um, and you mentioned, but, you mentioned infant addiction, like infants that are born with addiction. Do you have any stats as far as how many, how many like babies that are born? Like I remember going to college with a guy that had never drank, but his, his mom was such an alcoholic that he had, he had issues. Um, that were a result of, you know, he was adopted to a different family, but he was, he had alcoholic issues that were related to uh, when he was in the womb. Um, do you, do you know what the stats would be? Like what, what would be the odds or what, what does it seem to be that uh, someone born with a crack addic addiction, like you mentioned, would be an addict themselves? I can give you for those born uh -huh. with either fetal alcohol syndrome or yes. um, because it's substance specific. Um, as now, the likelihood of them becoming mm -hmm. an addict themselves, that, that I don't have because I, that would be, I'm not saying that they, there aren't studies, I just haven't found. Mm -hmm. That would be, um, let me look that up real quick. I just think as a, as a church that we need to have a real balance between knowing what's victim and what's deliberate choice of sin. You know, I think that the term victim is too loosely used. But we, we ought to really have, we ought to have a clear understanding of, of where, you know, where be really compassionate versus where... You know, you, you have to kind of be able to help a person be real and not and not just blame their problem. You know, obviously every person is a victim until they stop blaming. Um, I'm just curious about you know. Just Charlie, you didn't have to stop it. teaching. I was looking it up for you actually. No, it's the thing is, is that most anything on the searches they always show that the ratio of the the parent and then also the likelihood of the person being born with some developmental disorder. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't studies for that. Well, I, you know, and even the de developmental disorder is less interesting than the outcome. You know, it's, it's real interesting. I, one thing that always cracked me up was my cousin who hated his parents smoking, becoming a smoker. You know, I always, I never could figure that, you know, things like that. I just, I just think of so many people that, I remember my my cousin for his birthday every year would ask his parents for his birthday instead of getting the gift that they quit smoking. And for Christmas he'd say the same thing. I remember being a teenager and saying, you know what, instead of buying the Christmas present, could you quit smoking? You know, and then realizing that when you, you know, turn 18 or 19, you start smoking. Yeah. And I don't know if that was just out of bitterness or anger, you know, like, if you're going to wreck your life, I'm going to wreck mine show you what it's like. Or whether it's as, as whether well the thing is there's no mm -hmm. physiological connection. Point. No, there there isn't for 
for him. But you know what I'm saying is that is that you know on the one hand a person you know if you're off of a substance and you've never touched it on a personal level, for instance, uh, your most babies who are born with um, fetal alcohol is, uh, or and uh, the the uh, you know the different substances most of those babies are the the mother loses custody and they're usually raised in either a, you know. Yeah, foster, foster, care. foster care or in adopted homes and I know that some of the wisdom in adopting is that you know that you're going to have a rough time if you adopt a baby with one of those addictions but then I know I just I can think of several you know pastor friends that have adopted in those instances and it's just been a non-issue well here's a stat for you a recent analysis by the CDC estimated that 6 out of every 1,000 infants are born with NAS that's the uh, the neonatal as uh, abstinence syndrome which is just a direct connection to opioids it doesn't include what Pastor's talking about you know, the alcohol um, part but that that is that's a, a thousand. Yeah, six, yes. 6 out of every 1,000 yeah. Well, that you said is it subspecific? No, yeah. six out of a thousand. Okay. Six out of a thousand. And that's... So almost one out of a hundred. That's a pretty high ratio, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah, it just goes to show that there's a lot more people that are... And again, that's like opioids. Yeah, no, I know. You, you, when you yeah. do the searches, you have to do specific because... Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's really like even, even in our county, you know, we're seeing this phenomenon of, of the... Uh, now it's the marijuana, you know, but it was the pill mills, and the, and the government cracked down on pill mills, but back in, what was it, about 2012 or so? And remember all the businesses on commercial, they were all sitting empty, they all got raided, and were all empty? Now they're all pain clinics, and they're all advertising, you know, free marijuana cards, like a prospect that passed one this morning, you know, that is... I mean that we do have. I mean to declare it a national crisis is way, way behind the times. Um, <laughs> part, part. Well, part of that is because there's a scam going on with the insurance. If that person has insurance, and they're treated for such and such, they make a claim on the insurance, and so they want to keep them as a recurring customer. So they just. Well, I understand the business oh. aspect of it. I mean, there's big money in bill mills, but the people aspect of it is. Oh, why, why somebody would ever turn to that? Well, I'm just saying that there is a very, very deliberate drugging yes. in our society. I mean, we're just drugging. You know, starting at, starting at, at uh, infancy, yeah, all kids are being evaluated for drugs. You know, it's amazing. I, I have parents tell me horror stories about, okay, so if you go to public school, you get what, a, is it an extra 2500 per student if the kid is on any kind of, um, psychotropics or... Oh, really? I really don't know. Yeah, yeah, actually every school, and there's money, I mean, literally your school budget is affected by how many special needs kids you have and how many That's kids crazy. are on drugs. So literally, as, as insane as it sounds, and I, and I know that, you know, we don't have, like, principals that are like, let's drug all the kids. Yeah. But it's a major part of the school's budget to have busloads of kids that are on substances. You know, That's I mean, there, there's money in it from the top to the bottom. There's money in it for the pharmaceuticals. Yeah. You know, uh, let, let me Google that real quick. Cause I know, I, I, I'm not sure what the, what the uh, difference is. I don't have stats on the number of kids that were diagnosed as being ADHD when they're not, uh, because that's still kind of, Argued as the fact is whether ADHD is actually legitimate. Uh, yeah, because you have it legitimately there, exists. There are uh, things that affect, but there also is there's just the nature of the child itself, whether it's male or female. Uh, male children needs to be both kids are active at younger ages, but especially boys need to be more. Um, Outdoors, exercise oriented, um, physically uh, engaged in, in, in being taught um, than what they are. Um, and by and large, also, it's the, it's the term that I'm looking for. They have the school evaluated 
on the basis of how many kids are passing grades. And then so what they do now is they focus on teaching towards being able to complete an exam and to pass an exam as to whether, rather than actually making sure that the student is actually competent in, in the subject matter, uh, which you would think, okay, would be, if they were able to pass the exam, they, they would, but you have a lot of kids that are passed through that don't know how to read. You know, I've, <laughs> I'm, I'm 42 and I remember even as back when I was in high school that I had kids, now mind you, I wasn't safe, but like I had kids that were, in, you know, ESOL that I helped, you know, get through school. And they, they didn't, you know, they didn't really learn English. You mean you let them cheat off your paper, is what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids that weren't with me, like, when we were in the regular classes, they, uh, you had my peers that were usually about a year older than me, in a lot of cases, uh, just couldn't read. They, <laughs> I mean, certainly not the Bible, but they couldn't, I mean, they just couldn't read, uh, I would think, even like on a third grade level. Wow. You know, and uh, you know, I I worked to try and get into AP classes a lot of times just because I was like, man, this is dumb. Just get some, you know, whatever. But anyways, the thing was, it was, and that was, I'm, you know, a few generations removed from what's going on today. Anyways, the thing is, is you had that going on. So a lot of times, what they do is they uh, are focusing on trying to get the kids to pass an exam, and um, especially with the younger kids. So that's being implemented instead of having a, uh, a, a comprehensive education uh, beyond just the subject matter as far as the fact that you also have with age specific um, with the younger that they have to be a little bit more active um, if they're deemed to be too rambunctious or too active or whatnot then they say okay well they'll probably have ADHD or whatever let's let's just drug them so that they're easier to make uh, control they're easier to to deal with it, to handle, and then so that's how they get, um, I guess you could say, institutionalized in a sense, with regard to towards that, legally. But that's just one instance of one aspect of it. You still have all all the kind of substances and whatnot that are that are out there. Um, I guess back to case in point, B, uh, not to take away from that, is that uh, ultimately at the end of the day, you have a choice. You don't have to. Uh, give in to peer pressure, uh, that's still at the end of the day a choice that's made. You, you choose to whether or not, hey, I'm going to ingest this or I'm going to do this substance. Uh, same thing, yes? Okay, so here I've had for, for Broward, the revenue per student, a uh, normal student is 7,163. Um, but then 15%, I'm having a hard time, it's, it's, I'm having a hard time finding the actual data, but I saw something that showed that 15% of the revenue that comes in for special needs comes from that revenue, which means that you have 85% additional funding for special needs beyond that. So if you think about it in terms of, yeah, the kid's worth $7,500 to the regular budget. Well, seventy. Seventy no no seventy one sixty three. This is taxes without any grants or extra funding. Like this, this is just okay. tax revenue. Well, it's not that much, but if you consider the Florida lottery and business grants, I mean that's that's not their total funding. That's just what comes out of your millage mm -hmm. for property tax per student. What I'm saying is, if eighty five percent of if, say if, if special needs, year. if only fifteen percent of that covers the special needs a year. Eight, you have an 85% over that increased budget. So what is that? I'm having trouble with the numbers. Wait, so you're, you're wanting to add 85% to that 7,100? Bring about 13 grand. Yep, that, he's on right. Yeah, so if, you, if you're an administrator and you have a percentage of your students that are special needs, the difference between a $30,000 or $20,000 or $15,000 student, now 85%, let's get, what is, if, if $7,000 is 15%, what's 85%? It's more than twenty. About fifty thousand. I mean, yeah. So the difference between a fifty thousand dollars student and you understand, my, my my only point in saying that is, is that there's money in this. There's money from every direction. Parents that have special needs students, like I have friends that have special needs students, they have full time 
a full-time worker that the government funds to be in their home. That's a job for that person. You know, in other words, there's a lot, I, I'm, not, I'm not questioning the legitimacy. What I'm saying is, is that one of the things that, that if you're gonna understand it, you need to be aware of is money. You know, and money does affect decisions. I know of someone who takes out insurance. I, I know of a lady who, put, who tries to get her kids diagnosed on uh, medications and then takes life insurance policies to, to her brothers and her sons. Her whole family says she's killing them. You know, every time somebody dies, you know what I'm talking about. Every time somebody dies, she gets an insurance settlement on it. And the rest of the family has a fit over her taking out life insurance on family members. Uh, in other words, that's, that's evil. That's not the norm, obviously. Um, but there's, there's some really great people, and then there are people that are crunching numbers. You know, I, I just... Anyway, it's, it's just, it's really interesting. Um, and I, again, I don't know that that's, I, that's all I can find is that 15% is tax millage toward the special needs in the program, but that means 85% more has to come in from somewhere. There's a lot of additional funding. And that, if you're an administrator, if I'm an administrator, I'm gonna be looking at my school's budget and how to pay teachers and how to do things on a larger scale. I'm gonna say, let's get more special needs kids. So, anyway. Well, I'll say this and then we'll move on. A lot of people don't want to deal with them, though. They, uh, yeah, I know. The <laughs> other students don't want to deal with them. They want them isolated, and then they usually, yeah, what's that? Money talks at the end of the day, for at least for some aspects. Yeah, that's true. So, back to Paul's. Yeah, I was to ask you about yes. Chapter 9, verse 27, you said task it might be more like reprobate. It's the same word translated reprobate. So that means that the person's not a believer. No, in other words, they're disqual. The literal, the term just literally means disqualified. Okay. It's just it's just translated reprobate in other portions of scripture. But uh, it's used as castaway here. It just means disqualified. In other words, you're not. You don't. You don't. Hypocritical. You don't pass. Well, not necessarily yeah, hypocritical. It just means you don't pass muster. In other words, you you if you were to put the fire. The words wouldn't stand up. Yeah, but it's not referencing words. He's just meaning where how he's using it here is in other words, is if I uh, I'm worthless or I'm useless uh, if I'm preaching to you guys, but I'm living something different. You know, he can't right? control himself here, like to the point where he can't use it. Yeah, and he, here's the point with Paul. Yes, among other things. What what Paul was trying to communicate was a fact. Now this is in, again in the context of the fact that he's not. Um, he's not. He's a God called apostle. He's not. He's not fleecing the people for money. You know, he has a right to ask for them, or ask of them money uh, to support him, just because that's God's economy. As far as uh, you know, that that they should that they that preach the gospel should live the gospel, and uh, you know the the laborer is worthy of his hire, and that you you know thou thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Uh, so that's that's the principle that he was trying to communicate, but. In here, towards this, uh, towards this last part, um, he's just expressing his mindset and his attitude. Look, I reach out to everybody so that everybody would be saved. And beyond that is that I'm looking towards eternity, and I'm living to hear well done. And in so doing, I, uh, he says, I keep under my body. In other words, I literally like beat it black and blue. In other words, I, I discipline myself so that uh, I'm not somebody that is going to be living something different than what I'm preaching because I want to hear well done when I stand before Christ. Okay? And then um, he says, everybody, you know, every man that's right with the mastery is tempered in all things. You know, you know they do it to receive a corruptible, but we an incorruptible. So in other words, if we're going to be mature, if we're going to be believers, that are going to be strong and in faith, and we're going to be standing before Christ to hear well done. We got to live the same way. Right? So, my point in referencing this is that Paul's attitude, or Paul's mindset, with regard to anything that would be. Uh, now, I'm applying this towards addictive substances, but also relationships, or anything that would ha cause him to lose control of his faculties. He says, "I keep under my body 
So that's a willful choice to say, no, I'm not letting that have power over me. Uh, no, I'm not going to let this person or this substance or that situation or whatever the case may be be a controlling factor or determiner of where I'm going to live, what I'm going to do, and the decisions that I'm going to make because I'm the one that's in control of that. It's me, it's my personal will to say yes, Lord, and, and no to whatever is going to distract it or turn me aside from doing God's will. Okay, so foundationally, uh, with regard to addictions overall, it's primarily foundationally a mental thing. It starts mentally. In other words, it's a choice of the will. Uh, now, there might be physiological aspects, again, uh, that are involved. The person might have a physical dependency uh, beyond just a psychological dependency on a substance or on a relationship. But the fact is, at the end of the day, it still turns out to be, I want to do it because I'm choosing to. It's a choice of the person's will. And Paul makes that clear here. Now, I know this is in reference towards him uh, wanting, to, wanting to live for God, but the principle still is the same as that. In other words, I have a choice as to whether or not something comes into my body or something affects me to turn aside from God. And so the thing is, with anything, sin is a choice. Sin's always been a choice. Sin's always, that's why we're held accountable for it. You know? That's why at, at, uh, well, at the beginning, as far as when, when, when God uh, confronted Adam about it, you know, you know, what, what has thou done? And he, well, he, he, he tried to blame shift on the Eve, but the fact of the matter was, is, you know, he made a, a, a choice of his will, and that's why, that's why he was held accountable. Uh, that's why we have a sin-cursed earth. Uh, second thing is that all sin is addictive. Okay, all sin is addictive, regardless of what it is, whether it's you know ingesting foreign substance into your body, um, or you know being something that um, being um, wow well, term just slip. Uh, being a gossip, okay. Uh, or, or being somebody that holds bitterness uh, towards somebody else. Yes, sir. I'm not trying to interrupt you. So no, no, go ahead. Um, the, are you going to cover too? Because this is something that I guess a lot of times we don't analyze as Christians. But, you know, you say sin is addictive. There are addictions to things. Uh, I guess the way most of us can relate to it is the feeling you get when you lose your temper and you're out of control and, and uh, everybody's giving you space, you know, versus uh, cutting, mm -hmm. you know, that's, like, that's, I don't, I don't remember anybody doing that when I was, when I was a kid, but people, you know, you'll see now, you, you go in the store and you'll see, you see girls with their arms just, just scarred all the way up and down, you know, and there's actually in a, a euphoria, I guess, that you get when you leave, that's an addiction, and tattoos, you know, they, um, I, I guess just I thought people were addicted to you know altering their appearance, but I guess there's a feeling that you get when you get tattoos. A lot of people uh, say tattoos are therapeutic. Yeah, that there's like something about that going through that, that's addictive. You know, and there are a lot of things that we're just I guess when your mind is functioning normally, it's difficult to relate to. You know, I I don't like the feelings. You know, I haven't been tattooed, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the feeling of pain. You know, um, when I bleed, I have to sit down. I, I guess I know what feeling you're talking about, but I don't like it. Um, I haven't used Nyquil in probably fifteen or twenty years because I don't like the feeling that I get when I take Nyquil, and about the only medication that doesn't make me feel in a way that I don't like is Advil. You know and ibuprofen based, you know, so, so I don't relate, I don't relate to the bad addiction, but man, mental addiction, like laziness, I can relate to that, mm. uh, gluttony, I can totally relate to, and there, there are, you know, we call, I, I, I don't want to be loose with the term psychological, but there are psychological aspects to what's going on with a person. You know, we were faced this last week. I don't know if y'all are on social media, but getting blown up with all the uh, commentary about the 
pastor that committed suicide in California oh, I heard about that. a week or so ago. You know, and everybody's take on, you know, all the things that pastors go through and, you know, and basically all these pastors confessing that they're suicidal and um, things that come along with that. And they're very, very real. When you let your mind loose and you don't make choices of a will, we're just all messed up. I mean, just everybody's got some de- to some degree, everybody's messed up. Um, if we if if it doesn't come down to a spiritual issue, like it's just there's no end to the diagnosis that can be made for every person. I mean, if you were to let a psychological have a psychological analysis of every single person, and they just watch behaviors, analyze behaviors, we're all victims of something that could be called an addiction if we don't get victory. Um, that's a good point that you bring out. I try and approach it, at least on both ways, in establishing this, is that we, um, our standard or our metric is Christ. Okay, mm-hmm. so in other words, what, yeah. what, um, what God says in his word and, and who Christ is is what we should be looking towards as far as, okay, this is normal, this is functional, this is what's rational. Um, oh, I wish I really had this before for this because I don't know how accurate this is. The... Supposedly, psychiatry, psychology, and well, quote unquote, the ministry is what's the the, the highest. Um, and then, and then you got like police officers and firemen, as far as highest, they have the highest rates of uh, like uh, suicide, divorce, domestic violence, uh, and those uh, those types of issues. But then again, I don't know how. So you're saying in the practice of psychiatry that that's the highest, they have their highest rates of domestic violence? And yeah, like divorce, domestic violence, alcoholism, uh, uh, like ministry pastoring would be within the top five. Uh, you have like psychiatry, psychology, you have um, um, police officers, firemen, and uh, like uh, first, first, first responders. Okay. The, that I guess technically would be uh, kind of within like first responders. Man, the it's, Marines, the, the Marines are just nuts. No, the reason that's mentioned is because that they, uh, by and large, statistically, anybody in those in those um, they end up, they end up dealing with. The worst of society, and then so they usually see the worst. Sometimes. Yeah, most of the time they end up, you know, they they. Um, yes. I have my the friends that I have that are psychiatrists and psychologists. I've always asked them what made them want to go into the profession, and it's always because they admired their psychiatrist or their psychologist. I've never met I've never met a psychiatrist or psychologist that didn't go into the profession. I, I'm not saying there's an exception to it. I'm just saying all the ones that I know. I asked them, what made you go into this profession? They said, well, you know, I just, you know, I just love my psychiatrist or my psychologist. And so, and that what makes me think of that is when I was assistant pastor in Delray Beach, we had a lady in our church, and she was just bats. I mean, she really was, like, she would call up and just tell you the craziest things. Just say, Pastor, you know, I was sitting in my room, and I watched... You know, I watched, you know, these people come through the ceiling, they're vacuuming up all the babies. And, like, you know, just, she would just tell you just stuff. And, and she was just, she was telling you what she saw. You know, and she became, she became a, uh, she was going to school to be a, a psychiatrist. And she became licensed and became a psychiatrist. And I always thought, you know, the people that are going to her for help, you know, like, she's, she's not right. You know, so I think that to some degree in the profession and the trade that bears out in the fact that most people that are in the profession are exposed to it. I just, when I was growing up, I never would have thought I want to grow up and be a psychiatrist or a psychologist because I never, never went to one and didn't really know one. But if somebody helped you and spent time listening to you and so forth, you know, it just, I think that that bears out in the trade just a little bit. Maybe you're not all right to begin with. When you go into that, that fashion. 
mm. versus high stress. So, you know, and, and again, they could, they could be traumatized, really, really traumatic life experience too. That's true. Um, okay, so for, for today, two things I wanted to get across. Okay, first off is that uh, addictions are a choice of the will, uh, and that all sin is addictive. Now, you might look at it and say, like, well, not all addictions are sin necessarily. Uh, but if they take away, I, I, would, I would beg to differ only because the fact is, is that anything that causes you to either have a dependency. Now, again, the idea of definition of, of, it, uh, of an addiction would be something that you obviously can't live without. And it's gonna, it takes over your life. It's a dependency that takes over, uh, that takes over your life. So... By, just by definition, the idea is that you lose control. In other words, it has control over you. You don't have control over it. It's not something that you can manage unnecessarily. There, you have individuals that are high functioning. You know, they um, drink however many, you know, large amounts of alcohol, or take however many uh, large amounts of, of of some substance uh, to be able to, I guess, to feel right or to function, and they're able to still go work and. Uh, maintain, I guess, socially, uh, but nevertheless, the thing is that that they don't have control because they they can't live without what it is that they feel that they need. Now, again, some of that is physiological, uh, but at the end of the day, it was ultimately it started out with being a choice of their will, and then uh, the thing is, if you're not in control of your body, then the thing, you know if you're not. If you're giving control over to something other than the Holy Spirit of God, then at that point, you know, the thing is your, your body is not your own. You know, you're bought with a price and you're supposed to glorify God with your body and with your spirit. So if something other than the Holy Spirit, some, someone other than the Holy Spirit has control over it, um, then the fact is you're, you're, um, you're doing something with your body that was not intended by God uh, for, for your body to be used for how your body was to be used. And Paul, Paul's admonition here is that he keeps under his body, you know, so that um, basically when he stands before God, he's not going to be somebody that's going to be a castaway. So he chooses to keep himself under. And if anybody's ever going to overcome any kind of addiction, they need to start there foundationally. And it's with their thinking. Now, we'll address the, the physiological stuff and, and how to deal with that as well. But the fact is, it's, it starts with their thinking. Their thinking's not right. They, they, need to, they need to get their thinking straight and realize, okay, when it's a choice, so I can say no, I can walk away from it, um, and two, I can control my body. My body's able to be controlled. I'm the master of it, you know, and I'm supposed to only relinquish control of it to the Holy Spirit of God. No one else, nothing else. Right. Do we have any questions? Not we're dismissed. Thanks, Charlie.